Good afternoon. I am Vicki Wilkins, Dean of the School of Public Affairs at American University. I am pleased to introduce today's event and excited for you to hear more about my colleague, Dan Gade's new book, Wounding Warriors. Events like this are an expression of the School of Public Affairs values in action, a chance to elevate public discourse and to drive par progress in policy, politics, and public administration. We are fortunate to count among our faculty scholars like Daniel, who offer insights to shape stronger policies in critical areas like the veteran disability policy. Daniel's passion for improving the lives of veterans is apparent, and although most of us can say as scholars that our research becomes our life, in this case, we can all be grateful that Daniel allowed his life and experience to drive his research. We are also honored to welcome Secretary Wilkie and look forward to his insights. As we prepare to celebrate Veterans Day, we honor and give thanks to those who have served in our country's military. As a military brat and then a military spouse, I was privileged to have a front row seat to the great examples of sacrifice, service, leadership, and community experienced in the armed forces. I'm grateful every day for those lessons. I'd also like to thank the teams from the School of Public Affairs and the Heritage Foundation for making this event possible. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us. I'll now hand it over to Secretary Wilkie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. And before I talk a little bit about Veterans Affairs and then hand it over to Daniel, um, we have to mark the passing of a great American today and a great veteran, uh, Senator Max Cleland, Georgia passed away this morning. Uh, what makes Max Cleland special is that he really became the face of those like my father who served in Vietnam. Uh, Senator Cleveland, as a young officer, uh, was in the siege of Quezon, one of the great fights in the history of the United States Marine Corps, when he fell on a grenade and was a triple amputee as a result. But he went on not only to serve in the Georgia legislature, but also as President Carter's head of the Veterans Administration, and then later as a senator from Georgia. Uh, his passing um, reminds us of, of great people and the fragility of life, but also those who dedicate themselves to others. Um, before we talk, you, you, Dean mentioned, uh, the Dean mentioned that uh, we're coming up on Veterans Day. We're sitting here on Pennsylvania Avenue, and I want to give you a couple of stories about how Veterans Affairs began. And it began not too far from where we're sitting. Uh, during the summers of 1862 and 1863, President Lincoln would retreat to the soldiers and sailors home not too far from where we are to get away from office seekers, but in particular, the Washington heat. But during those times uh, in the summers of those two years, those were the times of great battles, particularly in Virginia. And many people would often see this very sad figure uh, riding beside the miles of ambulances that were moving to the northern part of the city and to the hospitals. And he would poke his head in and say, how are you? Or what can I do to help you? How are things at the front? And just a few years later, in his second inaugural address, which I consider to be the most, most righteous speech ever given by an American president, the one Frederick Douglass called the sacred effort. He called upon the United States to care for all of the families who contributed soldiers who bore the fight during those terrible years. And it became the mission of the country to take care for those who had fought for the nation. In 1956, General of the Army Omar Bradley delivered a report, which I really believe is the foundation of Daniel's. Uh, great work, Wounding Warriors. That report went to his West Point classmate, Dwight Eisenhower. And General Bradley summed up that work in just a few words. And he said that the government's obligation is to help veterans overcome special, significant handicaps incurred as a consequence of their military service. The objective should be to return veterans as nearly as possible to the status that they would have achieved had they not been in the military. More stress should also be placed on providing benefits for those who sacrifice the most and who need help the most. Uh, there is a misconception out there 
that uh, everyone who is a veteran has borne the brunt of the fight, uh, that they are all warriors who have, have been wounded or are hurt in combat. Well, uh, but less than 10% of those, I'm one of them, who've been in uniform, have been in the position that Daniel's been in. Yet, uh, since the attacks of 2001, uh, the amount of veterans, the number of veterans claiming disability has skyrocketed. In fact, of all the, the warriors who've, who've been in the military uh, since those attacks in 2001, 37% are now rated 70 to 100% disabled. The numbers from World War II, which Daniel highlights, show that in World War II in Korea, only 11% fell into that category. We see an exploding percentage of those who have increased disability ratings, yet we're focusing on getting the checks and not getting them well and getting them back into society. Uh, that is the real thrust of Daniel's work. It's an honor for me to be here with him and thank him. And I you know I'm going to thank him on behalf of my former boss, Jim Mattis, who has praised his work as groundbreaking. Um, and I will turn it over to, to Dan. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So I appreciate everybody joining us today with, for this uh, important conversation. And, sir, thank you for honoring uh, me and this book uh, with your presence. You know, the roots of this story for me go back to when I was in the hospital at Walter Reed, the second time I was wounded in combat. So I was wounded November 10th, 2004. The anniversary is tomorrow. The soldier who was killed in that incident is named Dennis Miller from LaSalle, Michigan. And I think it's very important that we say their names when we remember them, because uh, eventually they'll, we'll all be forgotten, but those who are lost will be forgotten if we don't say their names. And so Dennis Miller was killed in that incident. But then two months later to the day I was hit by a roadside bomb <clears throat> that um, wounded me obviously very severely and uh, ended up costing me my entire right leg and almost a year in the hospital. Uh, five months or so as an inpatient, and then six months as an outpatient. So the roots of this book go back to, as I began to associate, my, as I began to be in physical therapy and occupational therapy and things with my fellow wounded warriors, what I was seeing in my own life was that my wife had put a great charge on me to get better and then lead our family. But what was um, what was going on in the lives of the, of the soldiers around me was that they had become dependent on uh, two things, really. One, on charity and on the great stuff that was going on there at the time, the free the free tickets to the football game and the free skiing and the, all of this sort of um, stuff that was given to these people because of their heroic status. And the other conversation that was routinely had was this conversation about how much disability benefits can I get here? How soon can I get on disability? How often or how much can I take uh, from the government? And um, I didn't yet have the have the tools to really understand what was happening around me. And so a year after I got hurt, I went to start my master's degree at University of Georgia, where Dean Wilkins was my first professor. Um, so thanks, Dean Wilkins. And, and um, I began to gather those tools as I was looking at public policy. And then I went to work at the White House. And so I went uh, in 2007. I worked at the White House 2007 and eight. I worked uh, for President Bush at the White House and and and. In that time, I got to see, you know, I had the user level perspective, and now I got to see at the very highest policy level perspective what was going on. And what was going on is basically this, um, and, and, and this, just this statement is controversial, but I think it's true, and it's a starting point for our discussion. We pay veterans to be sick, and then we wonder why we have so many sick veterans. We, as a society, as a VA, you know, the VA's healthcare system is excellent. It's well regarded, and 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 although there's occasionally hiccups that make the news, the VA's healthcare system is excellent. But the VA's disability system is working in direct contravention of the healthcare system because the healthcare system is trying to make people better, and the and the disability system is keeping them trapped in an unimproved state. And so then, after I spent my time at the White House, I went and got a PhD in in public administration and policy. And then I decided, you know, I really had the tools, but I also had a unique position as somebody who had been seriously wounded, but was also educated in this stuff. How can I begin to be a disruptive force, ultimately, so that I could help set the stage for true veterans improvement? Because the goal here and our society's goal, as General Bradley lays out, ought to be to return veterans to where they were, to better than they were before if we can, or at least to where they were before. And I always use 
the analogy of the sword and the plow, you know, so before military service, we were all productive plows. The military takes us in, beats us and heats us into, into swords and uses those swords for our nation's purposes. And then our obligation as a society begins then as we, as we transition these people out, how do we return them to being productive plows? Because what the current system does is takes those swords, some of them rusty, some of them dented, some of them with broken blades, and throws them in the corner where they get even more rusty. And this stuff contributes to the veteran suicide crisis. It's a financial disaster for the country, but fundamentally what it's doing is cutting the ground out from under our young men and women and giving them a vision of disability as the center of their, of their economic activity, where I think we ought to be returning them to work and productivity as the center of their uh, uh, center of their lives. Well, I, I agree with that completely, and I'll, and I'll give you the first anecdote. Um, and I think the problem that Daniel lays out is that for those like Daniel, my father, uh, Congressman Crenshaw, who have borne the very brunt of the battle, uh, the resources that we have are being drained for purposes that VA was never intended to address, uh, post-service aging, things like that. And um, I, wanted, I want Daniel to address something that he hit upon when he said that people are thankful for the football tickets and the tickets to concerts, but there is um, a patina of victimhood mm -hmm. that is pushed upon veterans that I certainly have seen in the professional stages of my life. And I wanted you to comment on that and how that contributes to the system that creates a spiral that so many people can't get out. Yeah, for sure. So in, in public policy, we, common we commonly talk about iron triangles, you know, congressional committees and, 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 and interest groups and how all of that works out. And in this case, we have the perfect, uh, the perfect story, basically, about how to um, protect, how an interest group can protect its interests. So I'll, I'll back up a little bit and say the political left Basically, and I, I know probably the, the folks from American are, are hair standing on edge because they're like, oh, gosh, you know, he's going to talk about the political left. But the political left essentially believes that um, that veterans are victims of a patriarchal system. They're they're um, victims of a an, an, an effort to empire build and that they're economic draftees. You know, they don't have any other options. John Kerry famously said, if you're smart, you go to college. If you're right. dumb, you go to Iraq. You know, so that's and so therefore, because they're victims, they deserve everything. The political right has the same problem from a different angle, because the political right believes that anybody who ever looked at a uniform, whether they're a it's generator a mechanic or a coast in, or in the Coast Guard or a Navy SEAL with the Medal of Honor, like the guy I met the other night, um, that they're a hero and therefore they deserve everything. And so the political left and right come together on this idea of deserve everything. And then the interest groups involved stand under the earned everything, deserve everything tree, and shake the tree for money. And so the interest groups, their real desire is to get benefits for their, for their subscribers. It's just like every other interest group. It's just like, you know, it, I mean, they're behaving as interest groups, and their goal is really to get as much disability benefits as possible without ever realizing the truth, which is that disability benefits can and do trap veterans in a lifetime of disability, trap them in a lifetime of malaise in which they never achieve a, an improved circumstance. So they never begin to work. They never begin to, to produce and create and thrive. And so they're stuck at this sort of poverty trap level of income. And it's the interest groups that caused it and a compliant Congress, left and right, that created it. Well, that, that goes to a, a deeper issue in this country where I know General Mattis talks about it a great deal, but only 4% of the population is even qualified to serve. And we have uh, very few members of Congress who've ever put on a uniform. And since uh, he mentioned the, the political left, I will uh, reiterate what Daniel said about the political right. Uh, on my side of the aisle, uh, the, the belief is that anyone uh, with a uniform has become Audie Murphy. Yeah, that's right. And um, I'll just say it, the majority of those who serve uh, in the United States Army and the United States Marine Corps are mechanics. Um, noble, noble, noble profession, um, but we're not Audie Murphy. 
And um, because of that, you get this skewed view of what veterans do and what they should be doing. Uh, I, um, I, I would also point out that we have a, a support system that has been uh, incredibly resistant uh, to reform. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can tell you sitting in that uh, top floor office uh, that there was absolutely no support for us finally getting rid of my father's 800 page paper record, medical record and turning it into an electronic health record uh, from the professional veteran community. Not the rank and file, but the lobbyists here in Washington. Uh, when it came to making severe changes in the way we compensate, for instance, uh, in, in honor of Daniel and his service and those like him, we put those who hold a purple heart at the front of the line when it came to compensation and compensation decisions. The howls from uh, the professional class were deafening as well as many in the Congress uh, because they believe that anyone who's put on a uniform should be treated just like all the others. Um, and that is a disconnect that we as a nation have to have to address, but we have to address it, uh, as you've pointed out, with the goal of getting people back to work. So let talk to me about, and I, I mentioned Congressman Crenshaw's name, decorated Navy SEAL, of course, of course. Uh, lost a night. Tell us about how the system treats him as opposed to someone who, who would, let's say, an older age have sleep apnea. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the VA's the VA rates disabilities from zero percent to one hundred percent in ten percent increments, and you know we know that we desire to have vertical and uh, vertical and horizontal equity. Vertical equity means uh, disabilities rated at a higher percentage ought to be more severe as a general matter, and disabilities rated at the same percentage ought to be roughly the same severity, right? So Congressman Crenshaw, uh, his eye loss of an eye is a thirty percent disability. And he had to prove to the VA, and it took quite a long time, that actually he didn't just lose one eye, he lost like one eye and 80% of the function in the other eye. And so eventually they were able, they sort of multiplied that and there's some VA math there that goes on. But a single, a loss of a single eye is a 30% disability, okay, in combat. Now, the loss of a leg below the knee is a 40% disability, so a little higher than an eye. But the interest groups have made it that sleep apnea, which is associated primarily with two things. Number one, having a narrow neck circumference, and number two, being obese, uh, and number three, sort of peripherally being male. But sleep apnea, which is easily treated with a positive pressure breathing machine, is a 50% disability in the VA. And so unsurprisingly, as veterans age, they tend to get fatter and fatter, and we're all struggling with that in our, in our middle age. But the truth is, uh, sleep apnea is not a disability, and yet it's it, it's not a true disability. It's a condition that needs treatment, but it's not a disability. But we treat it as if it's more important, more significant than Congressman Crenshaw's loss of an eye or the loss of one of Tammy Duckworth's legs below the knee, and she and I were in the hospital together. So this is a this is a situation that is completely out of control. And I'll just throw another one on the on the fire since we're uh, since we're talking about these things. Um, the VA has what are called presumptives, and presumptives are basically um, if you are if you served in certain theaters, they assume that you're exposed to certain things, and therefore some conditions are associated with that. And in the in the Vietnam conflict, of course, the Agent Orange is the is the sort of bugaboo. You know, everybody says, "Oh, I was exposed to Agent Orange." Okay, well, a lot of people were, and Agent Orange is a serious is a serious matter. But the VA has placed type two diabetes as a presumptive condition for Agent Orange exposure, which means that every veteran who has type two diabetes and served on the ground, in the air, or in the waters off of Vietnam now, with Blue Water Navy being added to the list, anytime those veterans who are now in their 70s and, and 80s in some cases gets type two diabetes, they get compensated for that type two diabetes. And here's the problem with type two diabetes, that's adult onset diabetes. And we know for sure that the thing that causes adult onset diabetes is obesity. And as veterans get more and more obese and they age, it's no surprise that they're gonna get type two diabetes. The problem is now they can point the finger at the government and say, no, 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 it's the government's fault that I'm sick and therefore I deserve this benefit instead of looking in the mirror or at the scale and saying, actually, I need to change some lifestyle. So what it does is the, the system 
allows people to blame shift, be under the nice warm blanket of deservingness and blame shift and push their conditions off on other people. And so, and every veteran, every class of veterans, every um, sort of generation of veterans has the magic, I call them the magic disabilities. Um, so with the Vietnam generation, of course, it's Agent Orange. Um, with the uh, with the Gulf War generation, it's Gulf War illness, you know, ill-defined set of circumstances. And with my generation of veterans, it's a couple things: it's post-traumatic stress, it's TBI, and it is a traumatic brain injury, and it is um, now it's burn pit exposure. So burn pit exposure again, TBI again, PTSD again. All of these things are easily um, they're easily feigned, and there's also a possibility of people um, shifting the blame for routine conditions, things that are normal to the human experience off on the government and therefore getting paid for it. And there's a whole industry of lawyers and lobbyists and you know, claims people and so forth who will help veterans do it. And it's, and it's, you know, it's graft, it's yeah. really and it's, theft. And, and the part comes from the other part of the triangle and that's the Congress. That's right. Um, let me let me take a step back, and we, we maybe maybe we should have started here first. I mentioned General Bradley in 1956, so we are still at the the outer edges of America's golden industrial age, when a wound like Daniel's uh, would have been prohibitive in terms of many Americans getting back into the workforce. Uh, but that age is long gone, and I'll ask you to comment on. Uh, today, we, we have computers. We can work at home. We, we put an emphasis on the mind as opposed to the physical in many cases. And yet we have a view of veterans and disabilities that would have been familiar to General Eisenhower and General Bradley, uh, but not particularly relevant today in terms of how we can get veterans back in the mainstream of society. Other thing I will say, I'll add to this, and you please comment on it. Um, we instituted a program that closed the last circle from, from Vietnam, and that was home health care for Vietnam veterans, which meant we gave resources to those who took care of Vietnam veterans at home. Um, the view of this was that, well, in our view, uh, was that it should be temporary, that we get people on their feet, we get them used to using the tools that we could give them for their normal conditions of life. Uh, that quickly morphed into a perma permanent status, at least in the view of most of the Congress, so that people were never uh, weaned off or divorced from that particular program, even though the conditions at home for them would have been better. So again, we're looking at the world through the lens of the 40s and 50s and, and not adjusting to the reality of today. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the the caregiver program is a very popular program in the Congress, um, and it's a very popular program among a lot of veterans. And the caregiver program does this: basically, a uh, a veteran with a serious disability uh, who has a spouse or a girlfriend or a mother or you know a boyfriend or whatever it is, but some significant other who wants to get paid by the VA can file this claim, and then the the caregiver sometimes has to go through, I don't know if there's some little classes or something they have to go through or something like that. But then that caregiver supposedly can get payments for, or does get payments for um, basically associated with that veteran's disability. And the, the idea was a very positive one. It, the idea was, look, the VA can actually save money and the veteran could be more functional if we hire the spouse to do what the spouse is already doing. But the problem that I talked about earlier with disability benefits sort of cutting the identity out from underneath a veteran is made worse by the caregiver program in the following way. When, when somebody, um, when, when government puts a spouse in the position of quote unquote caregiver for the service member, What's happening is the service member who's already kind of feeling sorry for himself now is subordinate to his or her spouse, right? And so what that means is their, their, their caregiver, it, it infantilizes the veteran. It makes the veteran into a ward of his or her spouse instead of a partner, right? Like my wife did heroic work taking care of me in the hospital, 
And then, you know, she, she and I have shifted our, our responsibilities, you know, like I do less grocery hauling and more dishwashing than I used to before. Um, but she's not my caregiver and the term makes my skin crawl because she's my wife, you know, we are responsible for each other, but she is not my mother, you know, and I am not a child. But when the VA does that, it contributes to this idea, this identity shift towards dependency and towards looking to other people to give me my day-to-day sustenance, essentially. And it's very, very destructive. You know, I did some, I did some contract work uh, a year or two ago with NIH, National Institutes of Health, obviously famous because that's where Dr. Fauci works. Um, nobody would have heard of it two years ago, but now we all know what it is. So anyway, NIH um, was doing this study on suicide among veterans, and nobody wanted to admit that that paying veterans to be sick, increasing their opportunity or their desire to exit the labor market, the associated loss of identity with that was contributing to the suicide crisis, even though it's as obvious as the, as the day is long. You know, one one area that uh, we began to take a look at, and just in terms of time, in my my tenure at VA, I come in at the end of of 2018 from from the Pentagon. Is the Im- we look at the impact that the increase in compensation levels having uh, on our ability to provide services in the long run for you for Crenshaw for uh, the first Colonel, and um, we're on we're on a glide path that is is not sustainable. And as General Mattis has has expressed, we've substituted ameliorative cash with the need for direct healthcare services that can get people uh, back on the road to participating in society. Speak to that. Yeah. So, you know, in the, uh, so the, again, the book is called Wounding Warriors. Here's my copy. It might be on the screen there. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, the website is woundingwarriors.com and you can actually read a couple of chapters there, but what you can't read is the epilogue. And the epilogue is where I lay out some principles for a way forward because the book itself, you know, I've had a, a number of, of veteran colleagues of mine and, and pretty, you know, some pretty serious guys, some, some people who were wounded, some people who weren't, you know, friends, read this book. And I've had a lot of people say to me, this, it makes me so angry that this is the way the system is, that I have to put the book down and then come back to it. Right. You know, so this book is, a, it's not a textbook at all. It's a, uh, it's a serious policy book, but it's very, very readable. But in the epilogue, I lay out a couple of principles for how we can work our way out of the morass here. And the first principle is this, basically, We need to start as a society um, talking about disability in a way that's real. And we need to stop pretending as though every condition is a disability. You know, so when you see a disabled veteran license plate on a car, um, you might be thinking in your head, and most people do, and it's, it's okay, you know. If you think disabled veteran, you're thinking somebody who's lost a leg or an eye or has spinal cord injury or burns, what you're not thinking of is that the number one disability that the VA compensates for is tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. And tinnitus, by the way, is the only test for it is, hey, hey, Mr. Veteran, do you have tinnitus? And, you, and the veteran says, I sure do, doc. It bothers me terrible. And 10% disability for tinnitus if you have it or if you say you have it. Okay, so that's the number one condition. The number two condition is hearing loss. Again, easily feigned common to the human condition, common to the process of aging. Um, and but you a, should only give a presumption to artillery officers. Oh, right, right, right. But yeah, but they, but they, uh, they so they, they encourage you to claim that stuff. And then the, the, the third condition is either lower back pain or limited knee flexion, again, both easily feigned, and then somewhere in the top five is post-traumatic stress disorder, which by the way, you know, this is gonna be a controversial statement, but it's also easily feigned. There's, a, there's actually a textbook that I have that's a clinician's guide to treating post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's a whole chapter associated with the idea of, hey, if you're treating somebody who's claiming post-traumatic stress disorder, you need to be alert to the possibility that they're doing it for secondary gain, financial or relief from their work burdens. And so we just need to, we, we need to fundamentally reshape the way we think about and talk about disability. And we need to take 
we need to take actual disabilities and and you know a guy who's been shot in the head or a, a you know a woman who's missing multiple limbs or whatever there's not enough that our society can do for those people but we ought to stop pretending as though everything is a disability well the the, the, the former uh, senator from wyoming a korean war veteran named alan simpson uh, and i won't mention the organization but dealt specifically with veterans with disabilities, and he used to point out in hearings that 95% of the membership have non-military right. disabilities. Right. Um, and that gets us away from the purpose of VA, which is to care for those who, as General Bradley said, have suffered as a direct result of their military service. Um, let me talk about my experience with, with the encouragement that many of the groups uh, give to people coming out of service. It's almost as if uh, they encourage them to play disability bingo. Mm -hmm. which you, you For sure they do, yeah. Um, and it's almost a prodding. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it is incredibly destructive to the system. And I think right now, if I've got my numbers straight, my last, the last budget that I produced for VA was $240 billion. Um, covering 174 hospitals and 1,200 clinics. But half of that was in compensation. Um, and we've seen an explosion in compensation um, since the attacks of 2001. Talk about that mindset and what we need to do on the active duty side and the Pentagon's responsibility for transition and how VA can turn around and turn off disability bingo and get people who need it into medical services as a condition of receiving any yeah. uh, check from the government. So the, it, it, it's very common these days for the disability determination to be made before somebody leaves military service and before they've fully completed their course of treatment, whatever that treatment might be. And some things we can expect with a straight face to respond to treatment. So for example, I have a, a, a friend named Rich McNally, who's a professor at Harvard, and he's shown, um, he's shown clinically again and again and again that even people who've experienced severe interpersonal trauma like rape can and do recover from the post-traumatic stress disorder part of that as long as they're given the right treatment. But the one group in society that does not respond to post-traumatic stress disorder treatment is veterans who, are, who have applied for disability or who are pursuing disability. And there's a 2021 paper that describes, hey, you don't even use these people as treatment groups because they're not gonna respond and here's why. And it's very interesting. So, so the first thing we gotta do is instead of, and for certain disabilities, obviously you can't fake an amputation. You know, there, you know basically what the course of treatment is going to be and what, what a successful end state for that treatment looks like. And so you can apply a disability label at some point there if you need to. But for things like post-traumatic stress disorder, there's no requirement, and this is amazing to people, there's no requirement once you receive a diagnosis of PTSD and a compensation package for it from the VA, there's no requirement that you seek ongoing treatment at all. You can just go goof off for the rest of your life. And so if you're willing to go through those, go through those steps, get a Disability benefits questionnaire, sometimes from a pretty shaky doctor, turn it into the VA, it's pretty easy to, to feign that stuff. And so what we need to do is establish a treatment compensation link for certain kinds of disabilities, especially truthfully, especially mental health care conditions. And it would accomplish three things. Number one is it would reduce the amount of feigning because people would realize, oh gosh, I've got to, you know, if I'm going to fake this, I'm going to have to go in and go to my weekly or monthly appointments and it's a big pain in the neck. And so it's going to naturally reduce the amount of feigning. Number two, people who are truly sick are gonna get treatment that would make them better, and we should all be very happy about that, and that makes a lot of sense. But the third is actually kind of the most interesting sequel to what that would look like, and that is veterans who are very sick, but who are not receiving treatment because they're too sick to come out, they're too sick to, uh, you know, they, they feel as though, or they act as though they, they can't participate in society, they don't wanna come out, those people are going to be detected. And then we can send a social worker to their house. We can send, if we need to send a deputy sheriff to their house, we, need, we can send some kind of care worker to their house to say, hey, veteran, are you okay? Is there anything we can do? We can proactively find those people 
before they self-harm or before they self continue to self-medicate and all those things. So it would help us find the veterans who are really sick and get them the care they need. So a treatment and compensation link is a is a fundamental proposal that's in the book. Well, let me let me throw out a historical analogy. And, and I mentioned at the beginning, my, my father was grievously wounded in the invasion of Cambodia. And one of the parts of my childhood, incidents in my childhood that sticks with me is certainly seeing him come back at half of the weight that he was when he when he went to Southeast Asia the second time. But he recovered after three years and returned to senior officer status within the 82nd Airborne Division, which is the Army's most decorated combat. And yet he wasn't allowed to uh, wear his uniform off post. Mm -hmm. um, that Those were the times people did not want to see people and you had in those days incredibly high amounts of drug abuse, which actually bled over into the active duty military. He had to arm himself in many instances in the mid 1970s just to go into the barracks at Fort Bragg. Um, but it led to high uses of, of, of drugs, high suicide rates, and just retreat from society. Um, in many ways, I think our system rewards retreating from society in different ways, but it's the same result of what happened to the military and those who had served after Vietnam. How do we how do we change that trajectory? Because as you mentioned, we have professional veterans organizations. Mm -hmm. We have Congress, most of whom don't understand the culture and the language of military service. And and we have a system that is based on a 1940s concept of what a yeah. disability is? Well, there's a couple things we can do. And, and one of the things requires us to understand something about the human psyche. And about 85% of veterans are men, um, of living veterans are men. And about 80% of people who leave military service each year are men. So I'm going to speak to men, the, the case of men, just for a second. Um, men primarily derive their identity from their work. And so for anybody who has any question about that, I'll just point out to the last time you were on an airplane, which I guess because of COVID may have been several years ago, you turn to, the, you know, when you sit down next to somebody on a plane, if you're going to have any chit chat with them, the very first question that every person asks a man is, what do you do for a living? And, and, and the reason why that's true is because uh, men define themselves and society defines men by their work. So, we know that work has a very powerful protective function for it because it protects physical health and protects mental health, even among people with very, very serious disabilities. So I was on the National Council on Disability for uh, like four years. And uh, we know that people even with I mean, serious conditions like Down syndrome that they're born with, their health, physical and mental, is protected by being placed in work that is suitable to their disabilities, right? And so, so the, the first goal of our veterans care system should be to keep men and, and women, of course, women derive their identities, of, women drive their identities from their work and their marriages, if any, and their children, if any. So there's multiple streams for women, but for men, it's one thing, it's work. So what we ought to be doing is prioritizing work as the successful outcome for, for veteran transition. And if we do that, then that drives a series of, uh, of choices that we should make, that our country should make, that nonprofits can make, and that, and that, um, that veterans themselves can make. And that is this, you know, pursue work, help veterans find jobs that are meaningful, incentivize them if necessary to gain and maintain meaningful employment. And what you're going to see is that veteran suicide rates are going to come down. Veterans poverty rates are going to come down. You know, the esteem that the American people have for veterans will be restored because by the way, it's, uh, it's actually degraded right now a good bit. Um, so 20 years ago, Pew Research has been doing these polls for a long time. And 20 years ago, if you asked employers, Hey, you know, make a word cloud for veterans. They're going to use words like honor and hardworking and dignity and, you know, whatever, positive words. 
Now, if you ask employers to make those word clouds, the word clouds that they make are very dark. They're things like PTSD, mental health, broken, things like that. And that's on us as veterans. I mean, that's we need to fix that. And we need to fix that by by being determined to thrive. But it's also on the system that encourages veterans to be sick and not. Thrive. And it encourages people to. But, and, and the irony of, of, of that is that um, for our modern job market, uh, young Americans who've been in the military, and let's say they, by the time they're 25 or 26, they probably made as many important decisions, life-altering decisions in the workplace. By that age, then the average American will make in a lifetime uh, because of the responsibilities that come with just general military service, not the kinetic side, but just the day-to-day -day operation of the military. And that's what is so sad about this because uh, there are things that the military does now that they did not do in the days of the draft E force where you were a number and if you were if you weren't any good, you were thrown out because there were a thousand ready to come in um, by conscription. And, and that part of building uh, a military life has changed dramatically and uh, if done right, uh, produces good society. Um, I don't know about you or, or what the Dean wants to do, but um, I saw that there was a little time for questions. So I can't see how much time we have left. But um, I think there are questions out there. Yeah, it's, right. it's 143 right now. Oh, okay. We, okay. we have a question here in the room, and, and we can address that and then uh, maybe get some more from the guys. Based on Professor Gates' criticism of the VA, has he felt some sort of pushback from either the VA, veterans themselves, or special interests? And how might that impact policy change? Before, yeah, so that, that, before you answer that, I have. Uh, and it started for me with making a big deal out of the Purple Heart as a uh, yeah, yeah. discerning factor. So I can only imagine what it's like. Well, so you know what's funny? Um, so I, I've made this, I've been sort of beating this drum for a while from uh, my first published piece on this was in 2013 in, in a long form uh, magazine called National Affairs. Uh, yeah. I did a follow up in 2016 or so, a follow up essay to that. Um, and the New York Times, interestingly, I got there's a uh, above the full front page New York Times story about my uh, work in January of 2015. So I was then teaching at West Point when this when this story came out, and so my my email address was easily Googleable, and you would expect that I would get some pretty sharp pushback on criticizing this sacred cow. But I mean, on on Capitol Hill, just over here. This is the sacredest of all the sacred cows. You think reforming Social Security is hard. This is way harder because everybody who's a veteran is hiding behind this shield of moral invincibility. And the groups are hiding behind. They, they you know, every member of Congress is terrified of the people in the purple hats or the green hats or the whatever hats showing up and saying, well, you know, the veterans are here to lobby against you because you're you don't support veterans. I mean, they're terrified of it way worse than Social Security reform. Absolutely. And so you would expect that the emails that I got from people due to this New York Times article were strongly negative. But in fact, I got a, uh, I got maybe, let's say about 150 emails in the next 72 hours. About 10% of them were, hey, you know, die in a fire, we hate you, you know, we're coming to your house, kind of death threats, which I called into the FBI. Um, and, and, uh, but about 90% of them were clinicians and veterans and veterans' families and people reaching out to me saying, oh, my goodness, you're exactly right. You're so brave. We're thrilled that somebody's finally saying what we know to be true. And so when, when, uh, when I was working on this, this book, Wounding Warriors, uh, with my, with my co-author, who's a phenomenal guy, not a veteran, but a uh, Wall Street Journal reporter, and if you... If you're a former Wall Street Journal reporter, if you read the book and you and you you read that the, uh, the intro is clearly in my voice and the epilogue is clearly in my voice and the rest is this very interesting prose that's it's just such good writing. That's all him, not me. Um, the ideas are mine, the interviews are mine, but the beautiful writing is his. Um, but when when we decided to do this book, you know, I was aware of the fact that I was sort of stepping in a political minefield but I don't care. 
And the reason I don't care is because it's the right thing to do. Because ultimately, you know, if, if your, if your child is doing something wrong and you don't say something to your child to correct them, then you don't, it's, it's because you don't love your child. You know, if your coworker is doing something wrong, and you don't correct that behavior, it's because you don't care for them. And this system, which is designed to help, right. is hurting veterans. And if veterans like me aren't brave enough to say, okay, well, whatever, so some people are gonna criticize me, if veterans like me and you and everybody else aren't brave enough to do it, then who will, right? So we wrote this book, and I, one of the first things I did was like, how can I, you know, who should I send this to? So I sent it to Secretary Mattis, former Secretary of Defense, I sent it to Secretary Nicholson, former Secretary of the VA, Secretary Peake, former Secretary of the VA, um, you know, a, a variety of folks. You were still serving as Secretary, and so you couldn't, uh, couldn't, or maybe I couldn't get I to you. I, I, I don't remember, remember yet. The rules were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, anyway, so I sent it to a bunch of very interesting people with, with credibility on this issue, and uniform left or right, because a couple of the folks who, in, who reviewed the book were are politically left, Jack Jacobs, Medal of Honor recipient, is politically personally left great American. and a great American. Um, they reviewed it and they said, my goodness, you're so brave and thank God you wrote this book, you know? And so that's been the reviews that I've gotten. And, and um, you know, once in a while I, I'll, I'll get some nasty comments and Facebook posts or whatever, but you know, who cares about that? If, if you're not brave enough to, you know, I, 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 you know, Dave Chappelle has problems, but the other day he, he got in big trouble on Twitter and, and, and he said, and I'm not going to quote him because, of course, he used profanity, but he said, who cares? Twitter's not a real place. Right. You know, this work, this work that we've done here, if it gets into the mainstream of, of veteran culture and therefore our political culture, it has the potential to really help veterans thrive in a healthy way. And that's my goal. That's the, all I care about. I'll, I'm, I'm going to use a personal vignette and then and move over into a fuller answer to your question on my part. Um, you know, when I was a child at Fort Bragg or Fort Sill, and uh, one of my classmates was called to the principal's office, there was always a chance that there was uh, bad news from Southeast Asia. And I certainly saw the sedan on two occasions in my upbringing pull up with the chaplain, the officer, and the triangulated flag. And serving those people um, has been an important part of my life. But in terms of being the VA secretary, I had to make a conscious decision at the beginning. I'd never been a doctor, never played one on television. I was very happy helping General Mattis over at DOD when this came. And I found that what Daniel found in his book, uh, the, the greatest obstacles, uh, and, and I say this without, without any glee or without without malice, I should say, um, were those groups, um, the guys who go to the Hill, not the rank and file, which is why I went to every state in the country to go around uh, the groups here in Washington. And of course, they unloaded on me. But I found that if I had listened, we would have never had the kind of reforms that took VA health care mm -hmm. from a 30 percent, 31 percent approval rating to 90 percent. Uh, we would have never had choice. We would have never had accountability that would have allowed us to get rid of 9,000 employees. We'd have never had the electronic health record. And they were an obstacle almost in every, in, in every instance. Uh, and that's the mindset that needs to break. Now, I will say demographically, that's going to break. Because your generation, the generation before me, very different mindset. They want quick answers. They don't like to sit around in a big hall. Um, talking about how bad the chow was on the Coast Guard truck. Um, they're not joiners. Mm -hmm. They're individuals. And I think with them, we have an opportunity uh, to preach the message of inclusion in society and return to what, um, what General Bradley envisioned. And, and if anybody tells you that the problem is intractable, let me tell you about General Bradley. Um, he came to VA about a month or so after Japan surrendered. Um, his friend, his fellow uh, Missourian in the White House, said, you need to run Veterans Administration. Within about 12 weeks of him taking over, um, almost 10 million Americans demobilized. 
and he had to create this system overnight, a system where he built in two years over 50 hospitals. He created the mechanisms that we have for the great American middle class, which General Bradley was a profound mover in the, the GI Bill that he implemented. But always in the back of his mind was how do we get those folks who had done so much on the battlefield back into the mainstream of American society. And uh, I'll just, I'll stop there. Any other questions from, from American? I don't know if you folks can see, uh, Dr. Wilkins or anybody, if you can see, maybe I can, I'll click on the chat here. There's a chat box. Uh, nope, nobody in the chat. Uh, are you guys able to see any of the Facebook comments? AU folks? There are no Facebook comments uh, right now, but if anybody's joining us via Facebook Live, they can uh, share comments there, and we're looking at those. We do have another question that came in that says, good afternoon, uh, joining from Charlotte, North Carolina. Question for both of the speakers. Thank you both for your time and insights. Can you speak to what is the proper role that professional veterans organizations should play in empowering veterans rather than contributing to keeping them sick and poor. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll I'll build on to the question that I, the, the answer that I gave a few minutes ago. Um, the whole uh, reason for being has to change. Mm -hmm. um, their reason for being now is no different from any other Washington interest group, um, and to perpetuate uh, the stream from membership to, to uh, to capture more members, they offer more benefits. And in this case, it is how can we help you uh, not return to your hometowns and your big city and your cities and get back into the stream of commerce, but how can we help you get more in terms of compensation from the government? It's backwards. Um, what they should be doing is offering uh, veterans who come back things like job banks in their communities, uh, talking to employers, talking to schools, providing that kind of conduit for those who have returned home. Um, but again, the model is changing. Uh, the, 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 the average age of most of the organizations is well into the 70s. Um, and as you see the drop off from Vietnam, the membership uh, really is go going down because it's a model that uh, on its face really doesn't fit information age America. But for me, uh, it would be to get out of the, the Washington interest group business and actually get in the business of making veterans whole and making sure that the medical services they need to make them whole are there and ready. Yeah, I, I would just echo that and say that, um, you know, that the model of these groups has always been to see how much stuff they can get from government, to see how much stuff they can get for their for their constituents, and and the modern groups are doing a much better job about providing purpose and motivation and um, and and tools of thriving. So at IVMF at Syracuse University, um, they have an entrepreneurship boot camp for veterans, and a bunch of a bunch of these groups are sending their some of their veterans to the entrepreneurship boot camp, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, Wounded Warrior Project, which you know used to be kind of a fun and fun and do this and get a free backpack kind of organization, has really under its new leadership, General Mike Lennington, who's a friend of mine, they have. Uh, refocus I'll, I'll say since they had some trouble a few years ago they've refocused on uh, employment as an outcome on independent living for people with very serious disabilities that kind of stuff and so uh so modern groups are are getting it a little bit but i think fundamentally um, veterans themselves need to be the source of any kind of positive change here and that's why i've you know, that's why I wrote this book. That's why, you know, I'd love to have you order one. If you use the code American on the website, you get uh, $5 off. Uh, I'd love to send you one. But um, I'm, I'm really trying to change the conversation around veterans from one of dependency and illness to one of thriving and value. Right. Um, any other 
We're we're actually at 156. I think well, Dean Wilkins is going to take us home here. Okay. But I, I have one more thing, um, Dean, before you uh, before you finish, and that is more praise for Daniel's work, his transformative work. And it comes from General Mattis, who said that uh, in praising uh, wounded warriors, said we can no longer submerge those with serious serious problems in a sea of others who are also lost in the system that allows their situation to go unimproved. Um, that's why this book and this work is important, and that's why uh, we need people to listen. And I want to thank American University uh, for allowing me to spend some time uh, with Daniel, and uh, I thank American for what it does to, to change people's perceptions of, of, of service in uniform and what life after that service is. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thanks.